2012, an exiled cleric from Uzbekistan was brutally gunned down in Sweden. He'd been hiding from a regime with one of the world's worst human rights records. But despite a massive evidence implicating the regime he opposed, nothing has come of the investigation. Michael Anderson went to Sweden to find out why. Going north from Stockholm, hundreds of kilometers towards the Polar Circle, is about as far away and as different from Uzbekistan as you can possibly get. Up here there are only a few small towns half buried under snow for a good part of the year. Life here is comfortable and peaceful, stories of political oppression and violence seem to belong to a different world. But even this is not far enough to go if you want to be beyond the reach of one of the most feared men in the world, the dictator of Uzbekistan, Islam Karimov. Karimov and his security police are set to literally hunt their enemies down wherever they are. And the way international politics works, they will most likely get away with it. Just how long the arm of the dictator is was demonstrated two years ago, right here in this remote, seemingly safe little town in northern Sweden, thousands of kilometers away from Uzbekistan. So right here, this is where the attack took place? Yes, uh, my father-in-law uh, came down from stairs to go to prayers and uh, he was attacked here and he was found uh, sitting with a pool of blood on the floor. The police theory is that the hitman was, was hiding here? Yes, the attacker shot him from here, presumably. In the back of the head? In the back of the head. The Uzbek dictator Islam Karimov has ruled the country for more than 25 years. According to human rights organizations, he's responsible for the imprisonment of as many as 10,000 political and religious dissidents and the torture and murder of his opponents. In 2005, Karimov is alleged to have ordered his army to kill hundreds of peaceful demonstrators. However, Karimov remains a close strategic ally of the West in the so-called war on terror and in Afghanistan. Well, Uzbekistan is known for being one of the most repressive governments um, and states in the world. It, it's distinguished by a uniquely atrocious human rights record, outright government persecution of people who are viewed as suspicious because they practice their religion outside of strict state controls. So that can mean uh, carrying a Quran in your pocket. It could mean uh, wearing the hijab. It could mean wearing a long beard if you're a man. And this, this causes many to flee out of sheer fear for their lives. Aziz's father-in-law, the man who was shot down in the stairwell, was one of these refugees, although he was no ordinary refugee. In fact, the man shot in the stairwell has since the mid-1990s been Uzbekistan's most popular religious leader, followed by tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people. His name is Obidhon Nazarov, and by the time he was shot in Sweden in February 2012, he had been hunted by the Uzbek security police for almost 20 years. But then the long arm of the dictator finally reached him. My mama взяла его, потом я пришел, я повернул его по сторону, потому что он все еще кровь все еще еще. Был в состоянии тогда или как? Да, он он был в состоянии, просто он не не был в состоянии контактировать с людьми, он был в состоянии. In court, the Swedish state prosecutor accused the Karimov regime of being behind the assassination attempt. The hitman, identified by Swedish police as Yuri Shikovsky, had an Uzbek passport. In Sweden, he was helped by an Uzbek couple, 
They were all paid into Uzbek bank accounts, and the political motive of the Uzbek regime, according to the state prosecutor, was obvious. Two years later, however, nobody has been convicted for the attempted murder, which left the imam in a coma. Davud now spends his time taking care of his father. He brought us a video from the imam's hospital bed, but after advice from the Swedish security police, we cannot give any details about which hospital the imam is in, his health, or even where we met Davud. He wanted to go with us to his family home in Stromsund, but that was deemed to be too dangerous. Улучшается день за днем, но он не в состоянии контактировать с с обществом. Но факт это это зависит только от него. Back in the early 1990s, Obidhon Nazarov became the imam at the main mosque in the capital Tashkent, where his direct way of speaking made him very popular. Nazarov was a charismatic individual, an imam, a learned man, a young man, using an Islamic lens um, to shine a light on some of the most pressing questions in the society. How does one live a moral life? And uh, what Karimov saw, not only in Nazarov, but, but other charismatic imams, was uh, a potential power base, um, um, a way to move people and mobilize people potentially against him. He was essentially viewed as an extremist and, and treated as, as, a, as a mortal threat. Was he preaching extremism? Nazarov was not at all uh, associated with, with calling for violence. So many people, uh, they trust my father. It was a big problem for, for government, of course. <laughs> could imagine. I could imagine. Out of fear for their safety, Dawood asked us to obscure certain of the faces in the mosque of the people who had been closest to the imam. And even now, this is, this is 19 years ago, and it's still dangerous for these people to yes. be identified, 19 years after they've been to the mosque. Yes. Speaking to thousands in the mosque, Obitran Nazarov openly accused the Karimov regime of having kidnapped and killed other imams who had criticized the regime. For the Karimov regime, the imam said, human rights defenders are terrorists, journalists are terrorists, pious Muslims are terrorists. Uh, I think this was uh, the la last days uh, for my father in Moscow. I think that uh, the people know that, that, that they maybe can lose my father. The imam was fired, but he continued to preach to his followers at his home. But one day at the beginning of 1998, a source in the police tipped him off that an order had gone out from the very top to stop him for good. Iwan Pakinul Dom. Пятого марта и шестого марта утром вся армия была у нас дома, чтобы э, забрать его. Они при, э, пришли к нам. Это можно было увидеть э, с окна, mm -hmm. что э, вся улица была наполнена с людьми, э, которые в масках, в автоматах. For the next 14 years, the imam would be on the run from the Uzbek security police almost always accompanied by his young son, Davud. Alex, <laughs> и э, из людей, которые э, находились вокруг моего отца тоже. Mm -hmm. э, тысячи людей были, были арестованы. Это, с одной стороны, очень, очень страшно. 
И отец мой всегда объяснял мне, что за ситуацию свобода не приходит просто так. Чтобы получить свободу, мы должны бороться. С того момента, когда он покинул дом, я до, до сегодняшнего дня, мы всегда были рядом. В одной комнате, всегда в одной комнате, в одной квартире, в, одной, в одном доме. The imam and his young son were forced to smuggle themselves across the border into Kazakhstan. Here they hid for the next six years until 2006, when the security police once again caught up with them. Между узбекской и казахской спецслужбы они всегда работают вместе. За несколько часов мы покинули дом, и после спустя несколько часов они пришли к наш к нашему тоже. They fled to the safety of the UN compound in Kazakhstan. The Uzbek regime tried to use Interpol to have them extradited, but soon after Sweden granted them political asylum. When the imam went into hiding, many of his followers were arrested and tortured because the police were trying to force them to reveal where he was hiding. In fact, most of the men here in this little Uzbek community in Sweden were tortured before they managed to flee Uzbekistan. Abdul Wahid worked with the Imam for many years as his deputy in the mosque in Tashkent. He told me how he spent months in the feared torture chambers in the basement of the Uzbek Ministry of the Interior. <laughs> he Luckily, in 2006, Abdul Wahid was amnestied and he was one of the 200 Uzbeks who in 2007 followed the Imam to Sweden where they were all given political asylum. Their stories about Uzbek regime repression are supported by the testimonies of hundreds of torture victims and international human rights experts. In 2004, the Imam's eldest son, Husni Din, and three of the Imam's closest supporters disappeared, apparently kidnapped by the Uzbek regime. Когда похитили моего брата, спецслужбы Узбекистана хотели, чтобы отправить сигнал на мой отец, что члены семьи тоже находятся в опасности. И из этих четырех человек до сих пор никакой известия. Никаких. Никаких. Davut showed me a family video which he says highlights the callousness of the Karimov regime. In the film, the imam can be seen playing with Husni Din's son, the imam's grandson. And it was this little 10-year-old boy who first discovered his grandfather shot in the stairwell. This is Muhammad, yeah? This is Muhammad, yeah. Who, who, who was the first who... To yeah. Who saw your father when he had been mm -hmm. shot? Mm -hmm. And this is, he's also the son of your brother who has who disappeared ten years ago. Yeah. It's quite a fate for uh, for, uh, for a ten-year-old boy. This is not very imamish. This no, is no. you know. Oh. 
He, he is a uh, 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 normal mm -hmm. person uh, and uh, he, he is glad and happy. Mutabata Shibayeva is Uzbekistan's most famous human rights defender. In 2008, after three years in prison, tortured and raped, she managed to escape to Europe, where she started collaborating with Imam Obitan Nazarov, defending Uzbek human rights. Не потому, что этот человек террорист, не потому, что этот человек экстремист. Этот человек уважает весь Узбекистан. Я нигде я не слышала, что он призвал экстремизма, он призвал терроризма. Нет, я нигде этого не слышала. Никогда не слышала. From his exile in Sweden, the imam used the internet to reach his many followers in Uzbekistan, and thus he remained a thorn in the side of the Karimov regime. But his message was always one of peaceful, non-violent opposition. When you're in Tashkent, uh, it's, it's not at all a rare thing to meet people that have uh, recordings of Nazarov's sermons. Um, people had them on their MP3 players and they would drive them in, in the cars and sometimes listen to the sermons. He simply uh, provides, in a way, a moral compass. This was not the first attempt by the Karimov regime to assassinate political enemies beyond its borders. And the warning signs were well known. Two other vocal critics of Karimov had already been murdered. The journalist Alisha Saipov in Kyrgyzstan and the opposition politician Fuad Rustam Pujayev in Russia. Both men were Uzbeks and both men had been killed after campaigns against them in the Uzbek media. Immediately before the attack on the Imam, the regime had launched a similar campaign demonizing him in the local press. И даже они опубликовали разные фильмы против, против моего отца. Это можно было понять, что они что-то планируют. И вы это И говорили мы... полиции здесь? Да. И как ответ мы получили от них, что в Швеции такие, такие вещи от рук других стран, от рук других спецслужб других стран никогда не было. Никогда не случалось таких вещей. Шведские спецслужбы, они просто обратились как наивы. То мы с сегодняшним днем недовольны с безопасностью после покушения, которое было, было сделано. We asked, of course, but the Swedish security police did not want to comment on the case. In court, the Swedish state prosecutor openly accused the Karimov regime of being behind the assassination attempt. Using phone and computer records, bank transfers and security camera footage, Swedish police had identified both the hitman, he had an Uzbek passport, and the two young Uzbeks living in Sweden who had helped him track down the imam. Tord Andersson is a local journalist who has covered the case since the first day. Of course, the, the locals were shocked and terrified when it happened. But there's been no news at all for, for quite a while, right? That's right. Nothing. According to Swedish media, Yuri Shukovsky was soon arrested in Moscow. But so far, the Kremlin has refused to extradite him. International observers say that President Putin is using the threat of returning the hitman to Sweden as a means of increasing Russia's influence in Uzbekistan. And without Shukovsky, Swedish courts have had to release the two Uzbeks who allegedly helped him prepare the assassination attempt. I, I've never heard of anything like this. It's, it's uh, quite an extraordinary story, really. Uh, an, an hired, a hired killer that comes from a, another country, tracks down a refugee, shoots him and managed to escape without getting caught. I think the whole story hasn't, uh, it hasn't got the, the attention it deserves. And uh, why, why do you think that is? The news editors think that it hasn't got enough identification. It's the way media works. 
too far away, too difficult to get to, too many strange names. Exactly. That kind of thing. Too exotic, too, too strange. It was shocking, of course, because there has never been anything like this here before. Oh, it just can't happen here in Stremsen. I have lived in Stockholm a lot of years and I think, oh, not here. Here's my home. <laughs> Well, I thought it was crazy because I saw it on Facebook, actually, uh, that, it ha that it has been a, like a gun uh, shoot. I thought it was um, like um, Middle Eastern problems have moved over to a secluded area of Sweden. Do you know why so many Uzbeks come to Stormson? I guess they need somewhere where it's peace, where they can feel safe, where they can uh, move with their families and have their children to grow up in a safe environment. The fact that the Uzbek dictator could reach them even here in Sweden, combined with the lack of progress in catching the hitman and the very weak reaction from the Swedish government, has led to widespread fear amongst the Uzbeks living here. In fact, exiled Uzbeks all over the world fear the long arm of the dictator. Mutabar Tashibayeva, now living in France, is one of a handful of prominent critics continuing to speak out against the regime. Two of them have been killed, and a third, the imam, barely survived. What I can say is that the Swedish government has been very quiet about this. Uh, the foreign minister, Carl Bildt, has written a blog post and that blog post is the only, the only reaction from the government. Not, not enough to send a protest to the Uzbek government? No. Uh... Writing his blog as he notes on holiday by the Mediterranean, the Swedish foreign minister promises that Sweden will take a harsh stance against foreign governments who commit such acts. We haven't seen anything of the kind. We haven't seen really any response in the roughly two years um, since, this, since this terrible event took place. Um, this is quite dramatic. This is, is, is a blatant and very bold act uh, of murder or a, a attempted murder on European soil. We haven't seen anybody from the EU uh, protesting or taking up, raising this case? No. Immediately after the assassination attempt in February 2012, the Uzbek community in Sweden was demanding justice. But today, with the hitman and his accomplices still at large, fear and anger have taken over. here we are, two years after the assassination attempt, and both the imam's family and international independent experts agree that apart from the minister jotting down this little comment on his personal blog, there has in fact been zero reaction from the Swedish government. No criticism of the Uzbek regime and no condemnation. We told the Swedish government in detail about the harsh criticism leveled at them and repeatedly asked them for an interview. But they could not find the time to talk to us. The signal that this sends to the Uzbek government that it can carry out attacks um, within its territory and outside of its territory with utter impunity. It's high time that there be a response. The assassination attempt of Nazarov should be a wake-up call for the international community. Something must be done to stop it.